Hello class, today we'll be discussing chapter 4, Wireless LANs. We're going to take a look at LAN concepts, wireless LAN operations, wireless LAN security, and a glimpse at configuring a wireless LAN. This chapter really focuses on wireless technology, not so much the devices that support it. We're going to be using some cheaper home quality uh, Linksys products to set up our wireless networks in the lab activities this week. And they do just fine uh, covering the same wireless concepts that the more expensive and more challenging to configure Cisco wireless equipment. Let's talk about the concepts. This will be the bulk of what's on the exam. Why do we do wireless? Well, the main reason is convenience. It supports mobility as devices have gotten smaller and we like to have wearables and we have uh, pads and phones and different um, laptop configurations. We want to be able to carry our devices around, sometimes even use them while moving like an automobile, a train, an airplane, that kind of thing. Uh, also, if we want to be able to move around to different workspaces or areas, sit in different places, a cafe, a cafeteria, um, a break room, uh, meeting rooms. Uh, wireless has a growing impact on the corporate network as it allows mobility. Talk about the benefits of wireless. Of course, you have increased flexibility, uh, theoretical increased productivity as you can now work in more places than just your cubicle or office. You have reduced cost. A wired network would require you to put outlets in each area and be able to plug into those and those wired um, connections have to go into a switch and the switch only has so many ports. Wireless, a single access point can accommodate up to 50 users. No wires needed, so the installation cost is low. And you have the ability to grow and adapt to changing requirements. Some of the wireless technologies uh, are grouped based on the size of coverage that they provide. Uh, one is called a PAN, a Personal Area Network, or WPAN. And uh, Bluetooth is an example of that and is used to connect mice and keyboards and uh, a cellular um, cordless headset and other small devices that are wireless within a few feet of the source and destination. So that would be a PAN or personal area network. It would be a wireless network that's on your person or body. A wireless LAN or WLAN is going to have the ability to operate in a business setting within a few hundred feet. You can usually saturate a room or a couple uh, closely connected rooms. And if we go to WLANs, wireless WANs, uh, those are wide area networks that can uh, go for 18, 20 miles in uh, diameter and they typically are used in rural areas or to um, provide wireless in a city. Uh, one example of uh, of that would be um, some of the attempts in Portland to provide a wireless uh, WAN. You've also got some of those in uh, like Stevenson and different areas. So Bluetooth, as mentioned up above, is an IEEE standard for wireless PAN and is uh, pretty popular. Um, it says that you can communicate over 0.05 miles um, or 100 meters. That, that really is inaccurate. You're, you're lucky if you can go 40 meters and really probably 10 meters is about the uh, limit of a Bluetooth signal. Bluetooth is uh, using a radio signal that intentionally uh, dies in walls. It's not very good at penetrating any object, so it has trouble going through even your car windows. So it would keep the Bluetooth within the uh, car space of your car and it wouldn't bleed out into another automobile. So Bluetooth really doesn't have that distance. Wi-Fi, however, um, is always getting a little more distance and it can usually go that's pretty accurate about 300 meters with no obstacles if it does go through walls or windows it's going to substantially reduce that distance in about half and so uh, inside a, a room or facility you can go 300 meters but as soon as it hits the wall the distance is, is depreciated greatly WiMAX, you may have heard of this. It was a partnership with uh, Comcast and some other companies uh, to provide uh, wireless WAN coverage. And it uses cellular technology to do that. And as you can see here, you can go about 30 miles in diameter. It's mounted on cellular towers, but it was called WiMAX. It's um, still around. You can still purchase uh, WiMAX uh, devices that plug into your laptop or other 
um, computer and they would connect you up to the WiMAX network. Of course, cellular broadband, which is just using 4G or 3G signaling, is uh, very popular for a uh, mobile phone. Satellite broadband, uh, uh, folks that uh, travel in an RV or uh, you have a mobile facility that you need to put on site, so the United States government likes that and their military, they can uh, deploy a, a network um, in a box and pop up a satellite dish and be connected to, uh, to a network over distance. All of this operates in radio wave frequencies. You can see those are radio waves here. So different radio frequencies have different qualities to them. And the higher the frequency, the more data can be carried on the wave. And so uh, often we favor or it's more premium to get the higher frequencies because we can put more data on them. Okay, here's some of the wireless standards that we have today for um, what we call Wi-Fi standards. So these Wi-Fi standards are all triple I triple E standards. Um, the 802.11 standard came in A, B, G, N, A, C, and now A, D. And it operates on two frequencies until A, D, which brings about a third frequency. So A, D is pretty significant change. Fully backwards compatible with all other wireless standards. AD for the first time has full backwards compatibility and operates on 2.45 and 60 gigahertz. There are some errors here. AC will actually operate on 2.4 and 5 gigahertz. So AC can, um, when you buy uh, the AC equipment, it may have only one antenna that would be cheaper and it would be the five gigahertz antenna, but it may also include a second 2.4 gigahertz antenna um, and it can achieve them much higher speeds than the 1.3 seen here. Also realize these speeds are theoretical or maximum speeds and that real speeds are generally around one half of this. Well, this is the evolution that wireless kind of took. Notice in the beginning we had A and B and A was on five gigahertz and B was on 2.4. So here's the rub. Notice that uh, A, 802.11a, used a higher frequency so it was able to get a higher speed. So five gigahertz is a higher frequency and could carry more bits per second. But higher frequencies don't go through walls as well as lower frequencies, so it was distance limited. So A could only go half or a third of the distance of B. So B could go about 300, uh, 300 feet, and A was only able to go maybe 50 feet. So people went with B because they wanted to buy one access point and stick it in their homes. And businesses typically went with A because they were... Um, able to put a separate access point in each uh, office work area. Then G comes along as, and it improves on B technology. Notice it's the same frequency as B, it's backwards compatible with B, and it gets the speed up. So engineers are able to match the speed of A. So B gets a speed bump and is relabeled G. And some new technologies come along with that. And then N, which uh, is a pretty current standard. So all those others, A, B, and G, are considered obsolete today. Uh, the current standard is N, and the N standard, for the first time, uses both antennas, 2.4 and 5. So it has full backwards compatibility. It can communicate with A, B, and G devices, and of course provides a, a huge speed bump by using both frequencies simultaneously to communicate. Wi-Fi certification, so Wi-Fi is a brand name and you have to get your equipment certified. So you pay the Wi-Fi Alliance money and you ship them your equipment and they will certify it as Wi-Fi compatible. And that's how it ends up um, getting to carry the Wi-Fi brand. It's kind of like the real, if you look on dairy products and they say real, real is a um, means there's real dairy in there and you have to actually have that tested by the um, real dairy association and they won't allow you to use their little label of quality if you don't so that's wi-fi the idea behind the wi-fi label is to help consumers know that anything they purchase that says wi-fi is guaranteed to interoperate with other wi-fi components 
so it's basically tested to ensure it meets those IEEE standards. Okay, if we want to compare wireless LANs to LANs, notice that at the physical layer we'll be using radio frequency instead of a copper or fiber optic cabling. And we have a different layer 2 media access control mechanism. With regular Ethernet we are going to use collision detection and with wireless we do collision avoidance. For availability, Wi-Fi can't be beat because all you have to do is walk within the cell range. So they have a cell or, or um, circular area of coverage typically depending on the antenna shape and if you're in that area of range you will have access. With wired you have to actually have a wire plugged into your device. Of course notice that signal interference is a big deal when you're dealing with a radio frequency. So other um, signals they can come off of a motor, a generator, a microwave oven, pretty much anything can generate a stray radio frequency that can interfere with your wireless signal. So sometimes we like to use a wired signal in areas where we have high interference. Also regulation. Wireless is tightly regulated by the FCC, the Federal Communications Commission. It is also regulated by the European Union. You'll see that if you look on most wireless equipment, it will have a European Union and a FCC regulation certification, uh, meaning that the equipment can be used in those areas of the world. Wireless NICs, they come in many shapes and sizes. Some plug into USB, like the ones you see here. There are ones that uh, plug into various uh, ports and connectors. You can get them as a PCI card that uh, fits internally in your device, and there are many other styles. A home router, a wireless home router like the Cisco Linksys. Cisco, by the way, used to own Linksys. They no longer do. It's been sold to Belkin. Uh, Linksys used to be a, a Cisco company. Before that, they were their own company, and now they're a subsidiary of Belkin. Anyways, that's why you see it say Cisco Linksys. And the um, routers that we have in the lab are the older um, ones when Cisco used to own them, so they're the in. This is an AEC router here, which is the newest uh, standard out. And as I say, there is a new standard AD, but there is no equipment available yet. But probably they think by Christmas this year, you'll start to see some AD equipment hit the market. Right? And so a typical home is only going to generally have one wireless router. It'll serve as an Ethernet switch, a router, and a wireless access point. So a wireless access point is simply a wireless device that converts the radio frequency into the wired Ethernet. And then there's a built-in, usually three or four port Ethernet switch on a wireless router, and of course a router. So a wireless router is really three things in one. Here's some pictures of different models of wireless access points. So notice in this picture, we are using a wireless access point, not a wireless router. Look at the difference. A wireless router would serve the purpose of the router and an access point. But in this diagram, you can clearly see R1 at the top is serving our router needs. So the wireless access point is simply communicating to wireless devices and then converting that into a wired Ethernet signal to go into the switch. So it really is just a, a translator or converter between wired and wireless. And these are some pictures of what they look like. They look just like a wireless router, but they in fact have no routing capability. They don't have an integrated switch. They typically just have antennas and a single Ethernet port to plug into your wired network. They come in a couple different varieties. You can get what's called autonomous or controller-based. An autonomous access point, but you have to um, log into each one and configure them individually. And you're probably used to doing this in your home. Through a web GUI or some type of connection, you would have to log into this and configure it with the settings, the SSID and the other settings it needed. This is what you'll be doing in your lab activities. There's a more advanced version of these access points called a lightweight access point or controller-based access point. And what they do is they have no configuration in them 
they phone home to a controller which tells them what to do. This is really useful in a business where you might have 50 access points. You wouldn't want to have to log into each one individually to set them up, especially since they have virtually an identical configuration. Instead, we would use a wireless controller, which is a little device you buy, and that controller, we have ones in the lab that support up to six access points, but they make ones that will do up to 500. You buy a controller, plug that into your network, and then you log into the controller's configuration menu, and it will show you all of the access points that are on the network. And you can click on one or, or all of them, and you can enter configuration, and then the controller deploys that configuration. It's really a quick, easy way to update all of your access points at once and keep them uh, moving along and, and monitored in a large deployment. So in a small deployment, we again would look at an autonomous access point. And this would be a look at, at doing that, throwing some access points in a room in a couple areas and then plugging them in um, through the wired network to our switches and PCs and routers and the internet. Notice how they're not acting as routers. In your home, you're going to probably have a single device here that's the wireless access point, that's the switch and the router. That's what's in my house, it's probably that way in yours. The device looks very similar to a wireless access point but actually has an integrated three or four port switch and an integrated router. In a business, they don't like to do it that way. They wanna have the components separated out for management and security purposes. Notice uh, the note here that having autonomous APs can be a real pain as you have several of them. Two's not a pain, but 20, that starts to be annoying to have to log into 20 different access points. So we would move into managed or uh, lightweight wireless access points and then we can control those from a controller. In this case the controller in this drawing is built into the switch. You can buy an Ethernet switch that has a wireless controller embedded in it so that you don't have to purchase a separate controller box. This is what a large deployment solution may look like. You'll see these in hospitals at Clark College. They're typically a mono color to fit in with the wall or ceiling so they don't stand out. You almost miss them if you're walking down hallways. They're mounted high on the walls or up on the ceiling. Occasionally you'll see a blinking light on them. But they really kind of uh, blend in. Notice the removable antennas. That's uh, intentional. They make antennas in different um, internal configurations so you could cover a 360 degree coverage area or a 180 degree or even a 90 degree or less and so you can really fine tune using different antennas where you want the wireless signal to go in that particular room or facility. At the bottom you can see an outdoor wireless access point. It's in a harder box to withstand uh, hot sun and rain and moisture so it's a weather sealed enclosure uh, and even the antennas are a sturdier uh, design for outdoor use. You can also get wireless access points where the antennas are embedded in them. You see that in the middle. A uh, drawback with that is you have to buy it with the antenna you want. Usually they come with a 360, an antenna that sends coverage in all directions equally. So you don't have the um, opportunity to adjust or fine tune your wireless signal as much as you do with the top uh, controller and, and wireless access point where you have multiple antennas that you can angle and swivel to different directions. Here's a look at um, the controller menu. So if this yeah, it was a Cisco controller, the one in the upper right are the ones we have in our lab and those are installed in the routers. Those slide in as a card in your router and then you have a web type GUI that you go into and you can control all of your access points in a network from a central management viewer. Or you could just buy a standalone wireless controller shown at the bottom if you didn't have a router to stick the card into. So antenna design, we have what's called an omni or omnidirectional antenna and omnis, um, sometimes called the rubber duck antenna, is your basic antenna and it provides 
um, the watts or energy of the wireless signal in every direction equally. So it would send it up, down, right, left, all around. A directional antenna is one that would have a particular directional focus to it. And so taking the same wireless energy that you were sending in 360 degrees and focusing it in one direction, it can go much further. So you can go to a much stronger, longer coverage signal by directing the same amount of wireless energy in a particular direction. And typically, again, those directions are 180 degree coverage or 90 degree coverage or something like that. A Yagi is like a beam. So a Yagi really is like a super directional antenna. A Yagi beams the wireless signal in a fine beam. It actually ends up being about 30 degrees of dispersion as it comes out. But 30 degrees is a pretty narrow uh, beam for radio frequency. And so a Yagi is the type of antenna you want if you want to go between buildings, say. Say you have a wireless access point mounted on the side of one building and across a field or an industrial park area or a par large parking lot, you want to get a wireless signal over to another building, kind of span your network and you don't want to have to dig up the parking lot to run a wire there. You could use Yagi antennas and point them at each other and you can get a wireless signal going, oh, many hundreds of meters. So different wireless modes we can look at. Ad hoc. This isn't used in business, but you can do this with two cell phones or laptops, and you can just take two laptops and have them share files in what's called an ad hoc mode. No wireless access points needed. You don't need a wireless router or wireless access point. You can just take any two wireless devices and beam information back and forth, and that's called an ad hoc. Infrastructure mode is where you actually have an access point. Right? So if we move from ad hoc, you move to um, the need for an access point. Notice here the wireless devices don't directly communicate with each other. They may still be moving the file, but they're going to move it through the third party device of an access point. Sometimes one type of ad hoc network is called tethering or a personal hotspot. And you see this with cellular phones where they may offer the option to create a wireless hotspot. You are in fact making an ad hoc network. You're sharing your internet signal with another device. That's just like sharing a file or anything else. There's no wireless access point involved. It's just one phone to another, phone to a laptop. It's two devices. Or you could share with more than two. Sometimes up to five devices can create their own small ad hoc network. In infrastructure, you always have a wireless access point. A wireless access point is going to have what's called a BSS ID, basic service set, and that's just going to be like a MAC address. It's an identifier of that access point. Okay, the distribution system is typically just an Ethernet cable. And the BSA is related to the BSS ID. That's the basic service area. So remember I said there's a cell or coverage area that each access point puts out typically in a circle like 360 degree omnidirectional antennas provide. And so you can see that represented here. The wireless access point projects a 360 degree circle of signal around it. Of course here the signal is kind of oddly lopsided, but forgive the artist diagram. Normally, you'd find the access point directly in the middle of that catchment area or signal zone, uh, and that's typically then the BSA, the basic service area. Notice the larger purple box is the ESA or extended service area. That simply is the culmination of all your BSAs. So you could think about it if you had a home and you had two wireless access points, one at one end of the house and one at the other, each end of the house is a BSA. So you have two BSAs. Uh, the north end of the house, the south end of the house, the entirety of the house, the culmination of all your um, catchment or wireless areas is called the extended service area. So like at Clark College, our extended service area is the entire Clark College campus, but it is made up of about 50 BSAs. We have about 50 wireless areas or zones within our campus. Okay, let's look at the wireless frame. It's a little different. Look how the header of a 
Ethernet frame in wireless differs from the Ethernet frame for wired. You have some extra fields here. We have a duration field that states how long I'm going to be using, how long I'm going to be speaking or sending. And this is because remember that wireless uses CA or collision avoidance and not CD. So there's some additional information in here. There's a couple addresses, not just one. We have three addresses. We have some sequence control, another address, frame control. You'll be reading about these and we get into them a little bit here. You can see them all when you go into your Wireshark and look at signaling coming from uh, the computers at school and you're wirelessly communicating with those access points. This is an example of what the frame type would be. It's uh, either management, control, or data. If you remember me saying last week that wireless actually wastes 50, well, let's not say waste, uses 50% of the available wireless signal to manage the signal. Only half of the stated signal is available for data. So if you had a 54 megabit per second wireless, the best you could ever get on that is probably around 27 megabits per second, something around half of the um, of the total and you can see why here we have to be able to send a lot of management and control frames uh, around the data and they equal uh, roughly 50% of the frames that are sent. Here's the different types of management frame codes. So we have a subframe code that would go in there and it tells whether you're making a request or a response and we have several different kinds of things can be done here. This is, of course, how you authenticate when you're using a shared password and that type of thing. Then we have, much like you do on a CB, request to send, clear to send, acknowledgements. So before you can send your data, you have to request um, clearance to do that. And then the access point would give you a a clear to send back and then you would have to send an acknowledgement back to that so if you envision I'm a wireless device and I'm wanting to send uh, some data maybe a web request I'd have to send a request to send I'd have to wait to get a clear to send back from the wireless access point I would then send an acknowledgement and then I would be able to start sending here's kind of the CSMA CA flow chart and it shows how wireless devices communicate. And this gets into what I was talking about with the ready to send and clear to send. Notice they abbreviate those as R2, RTS for ready to send and CTS for clear to send. So if I'm the wireless device, I go down, I assemble a frame, I look to see if the channel's available, so I listen to the, to the radio frequency and no one's talking. So I transmit a ready to send message, says I am ready to send some information. I then wait to get a CTS. If I don't get a CTS, I go into a back off time and I try again until I get the CTS. Once I get a CTS, I start sending my data until I'm done. Okay, This is how they authenticate. Um, they have to authenticate and then associate. And before they can do that, they have to discover each other. Usually that's done through what we call an SSID, uh, you know, like Clark Student Wireless or here at my house, it's called HughesNet. And so if I go in my laptop, I'll see under the wireless device uh, access points in my neighborhood HughesNet. And if I click on that, it'll then prompt me to authenticate because I've discovered the access point I want to connect to. And once I authenticate with the correct password, it will then associate my wireless device with the access point. So there's a three-stage process for getting your device connected to the wireless network. Remember that the SSID is a name. It's just a made-up name that is a unique identifier of your wireless network. A password is a shared key uh, that you put into the wireless access point and you also have to put into the wireless device. They have to match and that would um, authenticate the device as being allowed on the wireless network. We've already talked about the wireless modes. That would be the A, B, G, N, A, C, A, D. Uh, there's a, uh, 
lot of complexity with that when you go what's called mixed mode. So if you have a mixture of say BG and N devices, typically they will all run at the lowest speed. So if you have a B device on your network, it will typically slow down all the devices to that speed. Security mode, that's the type of security you're using with the password. Newer securities like WPA or WPA2 are much better encryption than the older WEP. So WEP is an old, considered insecure wireless security mechanism. Then channels, wireless, we talked about the frequency, 2.4 and 5 gigahertz, but you can further divide those into 11 to 14 sub channels. So you can, in the 2.4, actually have different channels. You operate on only one of the channels that allows different wireless devices to be operating on different channels. This is to help prevent um, collisions and confusion and slowdown in a neighborhood area like where you have multiple wireless access points operating on the same frequency, they should uh, detect the channel another um, wireless access point is on and move automatically to a non-competing channel. Sometimes you have to manually help the wireless access point get to a channel that is clear. Passive mode, this enhances security. This is where you don't advertise the SSID. Normally an access point will broadcast its SSID to all devices so they can discover it automatically. If it's in passive mode, we don't do that and you would have to manually enter the SSID on the device. It wouldn't be able to discover it on its own. In an active mode, of course, it is um, going to be more secure because we're doing that. We are going to not, in an active mode, you have to actively manually enter the SSID. So if I were to go into my wireless access point at home and um, suppress the SSID broadcast, it would be called active mode. And then I'd have to be able to find it by manually typing it in. It's case sensitive. This makes it much harder for people that don't know your network to discover it's there. Then we have the authentication. We already talked about these frequency spectrums. These are just techniques to split up the frequency into subspectrums so that you can avoid interference. Selecting channels. So again, channels are sub, uh, sub frequencies. And we start with the frequencies. We have 2.4, 5, and 60. And you can see there's a graph showing the different wireless signals that are in those. And I don't know why it says microwave frequencies. Those are not microwave frequencies. Those are radio frequencies. They're not microwave, they're radio. So that's an error in your slide. Okay, the solution to 802.11b interference is to use non-overlapping channels. We have 11 channels within the 2.4 frequency. And so we break those down, taking the 2.4 shown here as 2.5, but you get the idea, it goes from 2.2 to 2.5 gigahertz, which is about 2.4 gigahertz of spectrum. And within that, we break it down into five megahertz channels. So we get 11 of those. And there are only three of them that do not overlap. And they're shown here as one, six, and 11. If you take a look, you can see the orange um, signal loop of the 22 megahertz signal of channel one, channel six, and channel 11. Those are the only three non-overlapping channels. So those are the only three channels we generally use. Even though there's 11 channels, we only use 1, 6, and 11 because they're the only three that are non-overlapping. When you get to the five gigahertz spectrum, you get more channels. Now we have four non-overlapping channels. I think there's 14 channels in all but there's only uh, four of them that do not overlap, 1, 6, 11, and now 13. Remember that with 2.4, we had 1, 6, and 11. Now with 5 gigahertz, we have 1, 6, 11, and 13. 
so it's less crowded, bigger spectrum, and so we have more overlapping, more non-overlapping channels. Then if we pull up uh, the newest, right, we get up, up here, um, here, here's a look at what we call wide channels within. So when you get to in, it has the ability to run ultra wide channels. Let me go back and show you how narrow the channels are. This is the same five gigahertz spectrum. We could have four thin channels or two fat channels. Fat channels will carry a much higher amount of information, but the device, what it will do is if it detects other wireless access points in the area, it will drop back to using normal channels. But if it doesn't detect other competing wireless access points in your neighborhood, it will bump up to using wide channels, which gives you um, much greater throughput of information. Here's your BSA or what we call coverage areas or cells. And so the cell or coverage area is shown here. We try to make them overlapping and use non-overlapping uh, channels. So here we would be using uh, the channels 1, 6, 11, and 13. And notice by doing that, because those can all overlap, but if we couldn't, what we would do is use, uh, starting at the top, say one, and then uh, over on the left, we would use six, and then over the right, we would use, you know, uh, 11, and then we would have to find a way we would have interference in that fourth zone. So we would have to shut that zone down. We would not have, um, so we'd have to find another way to do it. Cause right here we would have uh, interference. Cause if we had just the three channels, do you see how they're, they're all overlapping? And so um, there are two of them that do not overlap on the right and left. And so we could, we could uh, do one, six, 11, and then repeat the 11 over on the left and right. So if we wanted to, we could take the left and right cell and give them the same channel because they never touch, they never overlap, so they could be in the same channel. But that's how you have to think about uh, the channels you assign to an access point. We in a business almost never let the access point automatically choose a channel. We choose it for them because we're gonna have it all drawn out and decided. In your home, your wireless access point is set up to just auto scan and choose the most uh, free channel it can. Okay, security. Wireless is just prone to security problems. Uh, you could have rogue APs. Someone could pop up a wireless access point and give it the same name as yours. And then devices could be duped into connecting to it and uh, revealing the, um, uh, the shared secret security code or other information. We have wireless intruders. It's pretty much impossible to stop from someone from hacking your wireless because it's bleeding out through the air. And so if they can get within the cell area of the wireless, and going back to this diagram, notice it's bleeding outside the building. There's the entrance there. They could be kicking it right outside the front door or parked around the back or side of the building, and they'd probably be able to pick up our wireless signal. Even though they are not able to get physical access to our building, our wireless signal is going to extend further. Of course, if they get in there, they may not have to break in because your data is actually traveling through the air. And so it's very easy to intercept your data. And they can provide denial of service attacks where they just send a bunch of garbly gook jumbled data and keep your access point so busy it can't legitimately handle the legitimate data. So everyone goes, wow, the network's so slow or I can't connect. And really it's a hacker providing a denial of service attack shutting down your wireless network. They actually sell little devices you can build. There's kits to build a wireless jammer. So that would be a type of denial of service attack. You can build these for about $35. They're small enough to fit in your pocket. You, uh, they run on a battery pack and uh, essentially you can take a cell phone battery and wire it up to a jammer and walk around and wherever you walk, it will wipe out the wireless in that room or, or area and completely no wireless, it will, it will kill it for, you know, like a 30 foot area. And so that's a, uh, you could plant those different places or connect those up to de deny people wireless access. That usually is what hackers will do that as part of another type of attack to prevent people from getting into their own network while they're attacking it from another vantage point. So denial of service. 
course, we can have denial of service that happens just from like a microwave in a break room or a, um, a diesel generator or a gas motor somewhere. So sometimes we get interference from devices that is a denial of service attack, but it's not an intentional attack. We are being deprived of our wireless, but it's because of high interference that is not intentional but it could be intentional where it was a malicious attempt to disable our wireless LAN. Of course, spoofing is the idea of um, pretending you're someone else when you're not. So one type of spoof is to try to pretend to be the wireless access point. Or in what's uh, put here, a spoof disconnect sends a disconnect signal to all the wireless clients. You notice one of the management signals uh, in the management signals section when we covered those signals was to disassociate. So I could send a bogus um, wireless frame to a device that says, I don't want to talk to you anymore, I'm your access point. And your device would drop off of that wireless network. And so if a device keeps dropping off, reconnecting, dropping off, it's because um, a hacker perhaps is, is um, throwing out disconnects to drop all the devices off. So it's pretty prone to, um, to malicious activity. This is a fun one. They, uh, they've caught people doing this in gas stations, uh, Starbucks, coffee shops. Uh, people come in with a, um, a, a briefcase or they have a bag on their bicycle and they have a big battery in there with a wireless access point. And it's set up to look just like the real access point. And um, it dupes devices into connecting to it. Well, it connects through the real access point and then grabs all the data flowing through it. So it prov provides a man in the middle attack. It injects itself in the middle of the connection between uh, the device and the legitimate access point. And that's what man in the middle or called the evil twin. <laughs> An evil twin access point is the access point that is not legitimate. Okay. How can we make wireless better? Security is the number one way. Uh, the, there are other ways, using the right antennas, adjusting the um, energy, the wattage that we send and the signal strength so that it doesn't bleed so far out into a parking lot or across the street. So we do want to go around and test our wireless signal in areas where we don't want it to uh, verify it's not there. And if it is there, we want to try to tune it out of those areas. We can also put wireless resistant materials on windows or walls. They make wireless uh, resistant paint uh, and you can paint your walls with this material and it will um, it will reflect the wireless off the wall instead of allowing it to go through the wall. Uh, we can do the same thing with films on a window. They make grounded films that you can put on a window that block all wireless. So we have ways that we can help prevent wireless from leaking out to areas. But this particular slide is talking about using encryption. You want to set up a password and an encrypted connection. If you go to a Starbucks, you have an open wireless. Anyone can read and see anything you're sending. So someone sitting over from you in the Starbucks or hotel lobbies, any of these public areas where they don't require a password, um, you are on what's called an open network. And that's nice, it's very convenient, but anyone can spy on what you're doing or do any of those things we mentioned. As I mentioned, WEP is an obsolete first generation wireless encryption uh, capability that is considered um, insecure today. WPA is considered uh, secure, but when available, you should always use WPA2 as the most secure wireless because it uses AES for encryption and AES is the current standard. Two types of wireless, personal and enterprise. So if you're choosing WPA or WPA2, you can choose personal or enterprise. The difference is um, pretty simple. Personal means it's one shared key. I have this in my house. There's a password on my wireless access point. And if you came over to my house, you'd say, hey, Dwight, what's the password? And you type that into your device and you'd be on my wireless network. We'd all be using the same shared key or pre-shared key. With enterprise wireless, it's exactly the same except we each have our own username and password. This is how the wireless at Clark College works. So you actually log in or connect to the wireless um, using a 
Radius server, which is a server that keeps track of everyone. So Microsoft server is a Radius server and you could put everybody's user accounts in there and connect that up to your wireless access point. And so everyone would still be logging in with a secret password, but it would be their own unique secret password. That's obviously much more scalable to a large business and it provides additional security because of um, if you want to terminate someone from the company, you only have to dis, uh, disable their username and password. You don't have to go around and change it because if it was one shared one, uh, you'd have to go change it on all those devices. This is how you set it up. So any access point, even the one in your home, it'll probably support a Radius server. So you can set it up for enterprise uh, WPA or WPA2. And uh, if you are interested in doing that, it's a lot of fun. You can uh, spin up a, a VM, use a Windows server that you get for free through our um, Microsoft uh, DreamSpark subscription. And you can turn that Microsoft server, put in usernames and passwords for your family members. And then you can link that up to your wireless access point uh, by IP and uh, shared secret, and you could set up your own radius. Okay, things you need to know before you set up a wireless um, network, you want to know what the SSID is going to be, what's the name of the network. Like I said, mine is called HughesNet, very similar to the example here, HomeNet. You would want to have a shared secret. That's called the network password. You probably want a different router password. The router password is the password you would use to log in and reconfigure the router. I like to keep those both separate. That way, if I'm giving a shared secret out and it leaks out to the wrong people, they can't go in and, and change the configuration in my router. You can sometimes create a guest network. A guest network is a less secure network that typically cannot access your internal servers and networks. And you can create a separate password for that. I have this at my house, so if you actually came to visit, I wouldn't give you my wireless password. I would give you the wireless password to my guest network. And you wouldn't be able to access my media server or my internal computers or drives only out to the internet. So here's the steps to implementing a wireless network. First, you want to um, go over the implementation process with a single IP and wireless client without enabling security. We do security last. So go through and set up one AP and get it working. Verify one PC can connect to one access point without any security, just open connection. Then step two, you verify that that worked. Can that PC browse the internet? Are they getting the right DHCP and IP settings or are they connected? then add security, right? Then turn on security, get that set up and make sure that that um, then works. So they don't show that here, but you would repeat step two to verify you still had all those connectivities. And then you would back up your configuration and you could go on to the next access point. And again and again, you would go through the same process. The key here is security is treated as something we do after we have a working network. And you have a lab to do this uh, configuration, so we'll skip most of this. You're gonna read about smart Wi-Fi. Just got some tools, right? It's just a Linksys kind of technology there. You've got different uh, tools to help you. Backing up your configuration, how to do it. Remember, we've talked about this before, but I'll rehash this because it's very important. You need a troubleshooting approach. You don't troubleshoot by just jumping in and trying random stuff. You need approach. You either start at layer one of the OSI model and check all those physical cables and then move up to layer two and layer three and layer four, or you do a top-down approach and you start with the application, the installed software, and you work from layer seven down. You can do a divide and conquer. That's a test that you would do not to solve the problem, but to divide the problem up, find out what it's not. So ping or uh, traceroute is a divide and conquer test. It doesn't fix anything, but it helps us narrow down the field of where the problem is and where it is not. Okay. 
Okay. One reason a wireless network becomes slow is you have too much traffic on one network. So you could put uh, multiple APs in different channels. That would be one solution. Or in this solution, they've moved some of the devices in just 5 gigahertz and some in 2.4. I didn't mention this earlier, but if you have, say, an N or an AC device and it has two antennas, then the 5 and the 2.4, you could combine those together for really high bandwidth, or you can actually split them apart and put some devices on one and some on the other. So I like to put all my slow devices down on the 2.4 and all my, uh, all my laptops and uh, cell phones up on the 5 gigahertz. So I split the bandwidth up or the antennas. And that's a common thing we do in business to um, have fewer devices per frequency range is going to improve performance. Of course, you always want to start by updating the firmware. Always uh, start with the most up-to-date software on the wireless access point so that you have the best experience and the best performance. Okay, see you in class. Thank you.